This is a community-supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. The New York Attorney General has filed a 169-page lawsuit against the NRA, the National Rifle Association, alleging that the New York nonprofit has been violating its charitable mission in favor of personally enriching its leadership for about a decade now. The lawsuit calls for the dissolution or dissolving of the NRA altogether. Letitia James, the Attorney General, has previously won a somewhat similar case resulting in the dissolving of the Trump Foundation after it was found that Trump had misused charity funds for his presidential campaign. Quote, Charities are not a means to an end, which is why these damages speak to the president's abuse of power and represent a victory for not-for-profits that follow the law, James said in a statement. The NRA lawsuit is very long, so I'm going to go over selections that I think capture the heart of the accusations. And definitely, stay tuned for the dramatic twist at the end, where somehow, Ollie North comes out looking like the good guy in this story. Who am I? I'm Leonard French, a copyright attorney, but also a lifelong shooter. I learned to safely operate a 22 caliber rifle in the Boy Scouts, and I used to plink tin cans at a friend's farm in New Jersey. I recently joined my local rifle range in Pennsylvania and participate in bullseye pistol and three gun matches when I can. And I practice engagements with some local police, vets, and an air marshal at my local tactical range. I'm certainly not the best operator, but I sincerely love the sport. I believe in sensible firearm regulations like required training for first time ownership, but I also believe in the people's right to bear arms. This is Lawful Masses, my legal education YouTube channel where I do my best to bring you first-hand reporting of actual legal documents as opposed to just paraphrasing and characterizing the news through the lens of my personal biases. I can't completely eliminate my bias, but I can disclose it and let you decide what you think for yourself. It's important to remember that these are just allegations at this time. The New York Attorney General still has to prove all of these allegations in order to convince a judge or jury and obtain a judgment dissolving the NRA. While we can have some confidence that the New York Attorney General does not take this lightly, the phrase innocent until proven guilty still applies. Don't forget that you can adjust the playback speed via YouTube's settings on the video. With that in mind, let's begin. The NRA was founded in 1871, immediately following the Civil War. Quote, to promote the introduction of a system of army drill and rifle practice as part of the military drill of the National Guard of this and other states, and for those purposes, to provide a suitable rifle range in the vicinity of the city of New York. In addition to creating the NRA's corporate existence by a special act, the New York legislature provided a grant to the NRA of $25,000 of public funds for purchase in 1872 of the Creed Farm in Queens County, New York, later known as Creedmoor, a rifle range for the NRA and the New York National Guard. Over the course of 149 years, the NRA established itself as one of the largest and oldest social welfare charitable organizations in the country. The NRA is exempt from federal and certain state taxation pursuant to Section 501c4 of the Internal Revenue Code and New York law. This tax exemption is conditioned upon compliance with certain statutory requirements. As relevant here, the NRA, as a 501c4 org, cannot be organized for profit, must be operated exclusively or primarily to further the common good and general welfare of the community, and cannot permit its income to inure to the benefit of any private individual. The NRA has four affiliated tax-exempt charitable organizations that were set up under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code, the NRA Foundation, the Civil Rights Defense Fund, the Freedom Action Foundation, and the Special Contribution Fund. As 501c3 organizations, each of these affiliated entities must be organized and operated exclusively for charitable purposes and must refrain from engaging in political activities. The NRA also has a political action committee, the Political Victory Fund, which contributes money to political candidates. For purposes of this complaint, the focus is on the governance of the organization under the leadership of Wayne LaPierre, who, over the course of his nearly 30-year tenure as the chief executive of the organization, has consolidated his power and control over the organization. 
For nearly three decades, Wayne LaPierre has served as the chief executive officer of the NRA and has exploited the organization for his financial benefit and the benefit of a close circle of NRA staff, board members, and vendors. Contrary to his statutory duties of care, loyalty, and obedience to the mission of the charity, LaPierre has undertaken a series of actions to consolidate his position, to exploit that position for his personal benefit and that of his family, to continue, by the use of a secret poison pill contract, his employment even after removal and ensuring NRA income for life, and to intimidate, punish, and expel anyone at a senior level who raises concerns about his conduct. The effect has been to divert millions of dollars away from the charitable mission, imposing substantial reductions in its expenditures for core program services, including gun safety, education, training, member services, and public affairs. During the period 2015 to 2018, the NRA has reported a reduction in unrestricted net assets by $63 million. In his role as executive vice president, LaPierre has significant discretion and authority in hiring, promoting, and retaining NRA employees, in nominating directors to the NRA board, and in contracting with vendors. LaPierre has a fiduciary obligation to exercise that discretion and authority in the best interests of the organization. Instead, LaPierre often hired and retained individuals in senior positions at the NRA or as NRA contractors, whom he believed would aid and enable him to continue the organization regardless of their skills, experience, integrity, or contribution to the charitable mission. Among the senior executives that LaPierre handpicked to facilitate his misuse of charitable assets were defendants Wilson Woody Phillips, Joshua Powell, and John Frazier, Together with LaPierre, we're going to call them the individual defendants. LaPierre hired and retained each of them, despite their lack of skills or experience, for their respective roles and responsibility. Despite their lack of experience, LaPierre entrusted them with substantial authority for managing and administering the NRA's charitable assets and bearing responsibility for the NRA's legal compliance. In accordance with the NRA's bylaws, each of them was under LaPierre's authority and within the scope of his responsibility. Like LaPierre, each of them regularly ignored, overrode, or otherwise violated the bylaws and internal policies and procedures that they were in charge of enforcing. As a result of these repeated violations, charitable assets were diverted to benefit NRA insiders and favored vendors. At LaPierre's direction, Phillips, the former treasurer and chief financial officer, instituted a practice whereby millions of dollars in entertainment and travel expenses incurred by NRA executives were billed to the NRA as disbursements by the NRA's largest vendor. This practice evaded both the NRA's own accounting and board-established expense reimbursement process, and IRS requirements for proper expense reimbursement. LaPierre, Phillips, and Powell regularly used this pass-through arrangement to conceal private travel and other costs that were largely personal in nature, wasting substantial charitable resources and exposing the NRA to millions of dollars in potential liability for violating IRS reporting requirements. Powell was given pay increases at LaPierre's direction that nearly tripled his salary in less than three years, despite three complaints of abusive behavior and evidence of illegal conduct with inappropriate spending. Within a year after LaPierre designated Powell to lead the NRA's compliance program, he was fired for falsifying his travel expenses. With the assistance of Phillips, Powell, and Frazier, LaPierre abused his position as a fiduciary to the NRA to obtain millions of dollars in personal benefits in the form of undisclosed excessive compensation, which includes in-kind benefits and reimbursements from the NRA and its vendors. For example, LaPierre spent millions of dollars of the NRA's charitable assets for private plane trips for him and his family, including trips for his family when he was not present, in the last five years, LaPierre and his family have visited the Bahamas by private air charter on at least eight occasions at a cost of more than $500,000 to the NRA. On many of these trips, LaPierre and his family were gifted the use of a 107-foot yacht owned by an NRA vendor. LaPierre received hundreds of thousands of dollars in gifts from another NRA vendor in the form of complimentary safaris in Africa and other worldwide locations for himself and his spouse. 
LaPierre, with the aid of Phillips Powell and Frazier, procured personal financial benefits for board members, vendors, and even former employees. In doing so, they violated NRA policy on contracting and business ethics, as well as legal mandates on conflicts of interest, related party transactions, and prohibitions on ex gratia payments. As a result of these failures, the NRA, at the direction of the individual defendants, and with a series of failures of required oversight by its board, has persistently engaged in illegal and unauthorized activities in the conduct and transaction of its business. The Attorney General seeks a finding by this court that the NRA is liable to be dissolved pursuant to the law based upon the NRA's pattern of conducting its business in a persistently fraudulent or illegal manner, abusing its powers contrary to the public policy of New York and its tax-exempt status, and failing to provide for the proper administration of its trust assets and institutional funds, and because directors or members in control of the NRA have looted or wasted the corporate assets, have operated the NRA solely for their personal benefit, or have otherwise acted in an illegal, oppressive, or fraudulent manner. The Attorney General requests that this court determine that the interest of the public and the members of the NRA supports a decision to dissolve the NRA. Officers and directors have a legal duty to adhere to a corporation's bylaws. Failure to do so constitutes a breach of the fiduciary duties owed to the corporation and the corporation's members and violates New York law. The NRA's own bylaws provide that no director or member of the Executive Council shall receive any salary or other private benefit unless specifically authorized by resolution of the board of directors or an authorized committee thereof, but all such persons shall be entitled to reimbursement for expenses incurred on behalf of the NRA. On its most recent audited financial statement, the NRA reported responsibility for $197,212,080 in total assets as of December 31st, 2018, which, as a New York charity, it is required to use to serve the interests of its membership and to advance its charitable mission. LaPierre routinely abused his authority as executive vice president of the NRA to cause the NRA to improperly incur and reimburse LaPierre for expenses that were entirely for personal benefit and violated NRA policy, including private jet travel for purely personal reasons, trips to the Bahamas to vacation on a yacht owned by the principal of numerous NRA vendors, use of a travel consultant for costly black car services, gifts for favored friends and vendors, lucrative consulting contracts for ex-employees and board members, and excessive security costs. LaPierre's wife is the founder and permanent co-chair of the Women's Leadership Forum. LaPierre testified that his wife has served in this role as a volunteer for 15 years. In December 2015, at his wife's behest, LaPierre hired his niece to work on Women's Leadership Forum events and projects. The NRA incurs substantial costs for LaPierre's private air travel. LaPierre testified that it is NRA policy that he travel by private aircraft at all times for security reasons. He testified further that he is not aware of any limits under this policy on the kind of plane he can charter, how far he can go, or the amount of money he can spend on flights. NRA records show that between June 2016 and February 2018, the organization paid for numerous private flights by LaPierre's wife and extended family when he was not a passenger. LaPierre admitted that he authorized at least some of these flights. None of these flights was approved for security reasons, nor were they approved by the board. Several examples of the flights are highlighted below. In August 2016, LaPierre authorized a private flight for his niece and her husband to fly from Dallas, Texas to North Platte, Nebraska. LaPierre's niece and her family live in Nebraska, about 60 miles from North Platte. Asked why he authorized this flight, LaPierre did not identify any security issues, but testified, I think it's hard. There are not many flights to Kearney. She had a child, and I think that the travel agent had probably NRA, probably me, said that, okay, in this instance, it's okay to get her back that way. Our annual meeting was coming up down there. She was working on the Women's Leadership Forum with people in Dallas, and it's the advantage of the NRA to have her do that work. The cost of the flight was more than $11,435. 
In July 2017, LaPierre authorized a private flight for his niece and her daughter to fly from Dallas, Texas to Orlando, Florida. LaPierre testified that this was another example where I was getting my niece together with my wife to work on the Women's Leadership Forum events. She had tried to travel commercial. All the commercial flights they had, there was a mechanical problem. She was stuck there at the airport until 12.30 or 1 at night with a child trying to fly commercial. The cost of that flight was more than $26,995. In October 2016, LaPierre authorized a private flight for his wife to fly alone from Madison, Wisconsin to Kearney, Nebraska. Asked why she did not use a commercial airline, LaPierre testified, I think it was probably easier to fly private, more convenient, and probably the flights, there probably are not many flights into Kearney from that area, and we wanted to get her there and I thought it was appropriate given the return NRA is getting on the Women's Leadership Forum program. The cost of that flight was more than $8,800. In January 2017, LaPierre authorized a private jet to pick up his niece's husband in North Platte, Nebraska, on the way to Las Vegas for a safari club convention. LaPierre testified that his niece was working the entire time, attending various donor meetings at the convention, so he authorized a flight to bring her husband over to help babysit the child while the mother was working because there was nobody else to do it. LaPierre also authorized a private flight to fly his niece's husband back to Nebraska two days before his niece was ready to return. Asked whether this flight, which cost about $15,000, was in the NRA's best interest, LaPierre testified that it was. Quote, it's really almost very hard to get commercial flights back, LaPierre explained, and his niece's husband had to get back to work. LaPierre later authorized a private jet to fly his niece back to Nebraska two days later. In February 2017, LaPierre authorized a private flight for his niece and her daughter to fly from Atlanta, Georgia to Kearney, Nebraska. LaPierre testified his niece was in Atlanta for a planning meeting with the Women's Leadership Forum, and he is sure he authorized it to get them back. The cost of the flight was more than $15,000. LaPierre has also repeatedly directed private aircraft to make additional stops in Nebraska to pick up or drop off family members. Additional stops and additional passengers on a private flight usually increase the cost of the flight. For example, in November 2018, LaPierre and his wife took a private round-trip flight from Washington, D.C. to Dallas, Texas, and stopped in North Platte, Nebraska on each leg of the trip to pick up and drop off LaPierre's niece and grandniece. These flights cost $59,790. In March 2019, LaPierre and his wife took a private flight from Washington, D.C. to Orlando and stopped in North Platte, Nebraska on the way back to drop off his niece and grandniece. These flights cost $78,900. In April 2019, LaPierre and his wife took a private flight from Washington, D.C. to Tulsa, making an additional stop in Omaha and North Platte. These flights cost $49,535. The current treasurer testified that he did not know of any NRA business purpose that would be served by private flights to or from North Platte, Nebraska. LaPierre has also authorized private flights for NRA employees when he was not a passenger. For example, in February 2018, LaPierre authorized a private flight for an NRA spokesperson, her husband, and an employee of a vendor from Dallas, Texas to Fort Lauderdale and Washington, D.C. These flights cost $107,775. From May 2015 to April 2019, the NRA incurred over $1 million in expenses for private flights when LaPierre was not a passenger. These expenditures were neither authorized nor consented to by the NRA board. The current treasurer testified that, in the fall of 2018, the NRA eliminated all non-mission critical travel to reduce the NRA's expenses. Following the elimination of non-mission critical travel, Payments to LaPierre's travel consultant dropped by nearly 50%, from $2.9 million in 2017 to $1.5 million in 2019. Since June 2015, LaPierre and his family took private flights to and from the Bahamas on at least eight occasions. On most of these trips, LaPierre stopped in Nebraska on each leg of the trip to pick up and drop off his niece and her family. The NRA paid over half a million dollars for these flights. LaPierre testified that he often visits the Bahamas in December to attend a celebrity retreat organized by an individual who is 
the principal stakeholder in several businesses that have business relationships with the NRA. This person is going to be called the MMP principal. These businesses include Associated Television International, ATI, Membership Marketing Partners, MMP, Allegiance Creative Group, Allegiance, and Concord Social and Public Relations, Concord. MMP, Allegiance, and Concord entered into contracts with the NRA on the same day in December 2011. They also share the same chief executive officer and business address, which is located in the same Fairfax, Virginia office building where the NRA is headquartered. Together, MMP, Concord, Allegiance, and ATI have received over $100 million from the NRA. In recent years, MMP and Concord have been among the NRA's largest vendors. Since 2014, the NRA has paid MMP over $60 million for fundraising, printing, and mailing services. Over the same period, the NRA paid Concord over $22 million for public relations services. Allegiance has been reported as a professional fundraiser in the NRA's regulatory filings for many years. In its 2018 Form 990, the NRA described Allegiance's services as providing counsel and promotion planning for marketing and direct response mail and phone campaigns. Since 2014, the NRA has paid Allegiance over four and a half million dollars. ATI partnered with the NRA from 1997 to 2019 to produce and distribute a television series called Crime Strike. Since 2014, the NRA has paid ATI nearly $17 million. For most of its run, Crime Strike was hosted by LaPierre. LaPierre testified that he last hosted the program in 2017 or maybe 2018. From January 2018 to May 2019, the NRA paid ATI $4.7 million. From 2012 to 2018, the NRA paid MMP, Allegiance, Concord, and ATI more than $10 million in fees not contemplated by the terms of the underlying contracts. LaPierre denied having any role in negotiating these contracts with these businesses, but he personally signed most of the contracts on behalf of the NRA. LaPierre frequently meets with the MMP principal. According to his reimbursement requests, LaPierre took private flights to California on at least 20 occasions between late 2013 and early 2017, usually staying several days at a five-star historic hotel on Sunset Boulevard in Beverly Hills, just to meet with the MMP principal, often over lunch or dinner. Between 2013 and 2016, the MMP principal, his wife, and their daughter received over $6,700 in Christmas and birthday gifts from the LaPierres at the NRA's expense. LaPierre also regularly attends celebrity retreats organized by the MMP principal. When LaPierre attends these retreats, which are normally held annually in the Bahamas in December, he stays at the Atlantis Resort on Paradise Island. His lodging is paid for by the MMP principal. LaPierre testified that the MMP principal does not pass these expenses onto the NRA. LaPierre often visits the Bahamas in the summer as well. During these trips, he stays on a 108-foot yacht owned by the MMP principal. The yacht, named Illusions, is equipped with four staterooms, a 16-foot jet boat, and two jet skis. LaPierre described Illusions as a big, big yacht with a crew that includes a chef. LaPierre testified that occasionally one of our other family members has stayed on the yacht with him and his wife, including his sister and her husband, and perhaps others. LaPierre has never disclosed his use of the MMP principal's yacht on the NRA financial disclosure questionnaire that he, as an officer and ex-officio director of the NRA, must submit to the NRA secretary annually. Question four of this questionnaire asks, quote, have you or any relative received or do you or any relative expect to receive any gift, gratuity, personal favor, or entertainment with either a retail price or fair market value in excess of $250 from any person or entity that has or is seeking to have business relationships with or received funds from NRA or any NRA entity. LaPierre answered no to this question in every questionnaire he submitted from 2008 to 2018, which was the most recent questionnaire produced by the NRA to the Attorney General. 
LaPierre similarly testified that he has never received a gift of value in excess of $250 from an NRA contractor or employee of an NRA contractor. LaPierre's use of the MMP principal's yacht constituted a gift from the NRA contractor in excess of $250, requiring disclosure under NRA policy. It also constituted a private benefit to LaPierre in violation of NRA policy. In his testimony to the Attorney General, LaPierre said that the reason he failed to disclose the use of the yacht was for security reasons and because he considered the yacht to have been used for a legitimate business purpose. Though LaPierre acknowledged that the NRA questionnaires only go to the NRA secretary, he said he was concerned about everybody on security. Everything leaks. LaPierre also testified that he considered the use of the yacht as a safe place to do business and didn't consider it a gift. LaPierre further testified that these trips to the Bahamas were beneficial to the NRA because they provided an opportunity for his wife and niece to discuss the Women's Leadership Forum. Anytime I get the two of them together anywhere, there is a benefit for the NRA. It could be in Nebraska. It could be like a corporate retreat in Aspen. It could be a, you know, I mean, I consider it a good thing to get them together. Yeah, they got together in the Bahamas. It could have been in Washington. It's just it, it but keeping his wife's head in the game on this and getting her with my niece, there is a substantial benefit to the NRA. That is in the proof in the dollars that come into the NRA. I mean, did they enjoy being there? Yeah. I mean, on the other hand, did NRA get a benefit of them being there? Yes, absolutely. LaPierre testified that neither he nor the NRA paid the MMP principal for the use of illusions. He also testified that he has stayed on illusions during two European trips for the purpose of recruiting celebrities for the NRA. LaPierre claimed, without identifying any evidentiary support, that many of the costs incurred in connection with his travel and entertainment expenses, like the trips to the Bahamas and other locations with his wife, niece, and family members, were justified as an investment in donor cultivation. LaPierre uses his own personal travel consultant to arrange his private air travel and other accommodations. This practice deviates from NRA policy and results in substantial additional expenses to the NRA. The NRA travel policy provides that employees must use the NRA's official travel agent to make travel reservations unless otherwise approved by the executive vice president. Since being elected executive vice president, LaPierre has not used the NRA's official travel agent to make his travel arrangements for decades, if ever. Instead, since the 1990s, LaPierre has booked his travel through a travel consultant based in Woodland Hills, California. The travel consultant bills the NRA through two separate companies, Inventive Incentive and Insurance Services, and GS2 Enterprises. Collectively, we're just going to call them the travel, insult the travel insultant. Yes, good one, Len. Leave that in. We're going to call them the travel consultant. LaPierre testified that when his travel consultant bills services to the NRA, it is for NRA business and in furtherance of the NRA's mission. For several years, the NRA has paid LaPierre's travel consultant on a fixed fee basis. In 2014, the fixed fee for the travel agent's services was $15,000 a month, which was billed through a separate monthly invoice to the NRA for $10,000 and the NRA ILA for $5,000. These invoices were for the same travel booking services. Beginning in May 2015, LaPierre's travel consultant's monthly fee increased to $19,000, which continued to be billed through separate monthly invoices, $12,000 to the NRA and $7,000 to the NRA ILA. The nature and scope of the travel consultant services remained unchanged during this period. No competitive bidding process was ever conducted for the services provided by LaPierre's travel consultant until 2019, and no written contract was executed memorializing this increase in her compensation until 2020. From 2016 to early 2019, the NRA paid LaPierre's travel consultant a fixed fee of $19,000 per month. The Director of Purchasing testified that under NRA policy, the procurement of transportation services should go through a competitive bidding process administered by the Purchasing Department, but that during her 27 years at the NRA, that had never occurred. From 2005 to 2019, the NRA paid LaPierre's travel consultant more than $100,000 annually without a written contract and without written authorization from the NRA. This arrangement violated the NRA purchasing policy. 
From February 2013 to July 2018, Ackerman McQueen, just known as Ackerman, the NRA's public relations and advertising marketing firm, also paid LaPierre's travel consultant a $4,000 monthly fee at the direction of LaPierre and Phillips, which was in addition to the monthly fees the NRA paid her directly. Ackerman passed these expenses on to the NRA. LaPierre was repeatedly told that his travel consultant charged excessive fees for the services she provided and for the vendors she engaged on behalf of the NRA. After Phillips stepped down as the treasurer in March 2019, the NRA entered into a one-year contract with LaPierre's travel consultant, increasing her annual pay to $318,000. This was the first written contract the NRA entered into with LaPierre's travel consultant. In an accompanying business case analysis, it provides that for the security of our principles in this sensitive environment we sometimes face, we believe there is no other company that can provide the service and discretion that LaPierre's travel consultant offers. There is no evidence that the NRA considered bids from competing companies. The analysis does not address the increase in LaPierre's travel consultant's monthly fixed fee from 19,000 to 26,500. Services under the contract include making travel arrangements as directed by the NRA's executive vice president or his designee. On March 15, 2019, LaPierre authorized this contract. Less than a year later, in early 2020, the NRA conducted a competitive bidding process for the services offered by LaPierre's travel consultant. The NRA accepted her bid, under which she provides the same services she provided previously, but for a fixed monthly fee of $7,000. LaPierre testified that he was not involved in the business case analysis prepared in early 2019 or the competitive bidding process that was conducted. Quote, the treasurer's office handled it. I stayed completely, completely out of it. From August 2014 to January 2020, the NRA paid LaPierre's travel consultant more than $13.5 million. In 2018, the NRA paid LaPierre's travel consultant $2,630,531.71. In in the first six months of 2019 alone, the NRA paid LaPierre's travel consultant over $1 million. At LaPierre's instigation, the NRA reimbursed him for other expenses that were personal, including gifts to friends and favored employees. Between 2013 and 2017, LaPierre was reimbursed for more than $1.2 million in expenses. From 2013 to 2017, LaPierre was reimbursed for over $65,000 of Christmas gifts for his staff, various donors and friends. Most of his direct reports and executive staff would receive an ice cream gift basket each year from a retailer called Graders. But those in his inner circle received gifts from retailers like Neiman Marcus and Bergdorf Goodman. For example, at the NRA's expense in December 2015, LaPierre sent gifts from Neiman Marcus to his travel consultant, $648.55, his senior assistant, $350, and his prior chief of staff, $413. In December 2016, LaPierre sent Christmas gifts to the co-founder of Ackerman of $1,500, his travel consultant, $350, his senior assistant, $350, and Phillips, $378. In November 2017, LaPierre expensed gifts to his travel consultant, $444, his prior chief of staff, $311, Phillips, $283, and his senior assistant, $239, among others. Each of these gifts was substantially in excess of the $25 limit permitted by the IRS for business gifts, and reimbursement for such gifts should have been reported as W-2 income to LaPierre. Gifts were especially common for those affiliated with the Women's Leadership Forum. In December 2014, for example, the executive assistant to LaPierre's spouse received a $381 birthday gift expense to the NRA. In 2016, LaPierre expensed $1,500 in birthday, wedding anniversary, and baby shower gifts for five Women's Leadership Forum volunteers. In May 2017, LaPierre expensed a $418.70 gift for the wife of the MMP principal for her support of the Women's Leadership Forum. In May 2017, LaPierre's wife was appointed to the board of directors of the National Park Service Foundation. 
Over the next few months, LaPierre submitted expense reports for $13,874.46 in expense reimbursements for trips taken with his wife and niece to MPSF events in Alaska and Arizona. This was in addition to the private flights used to get them to the NPSF events, which cost in excess of $150,000. LaPierre has routinely submitted expense reports seeking reimbursements for his niece's lodging and airfare for events that are allegedly related to NRA business. As an NRA employee, LaPierre's niece was required to follow NRA policies and procedures for seeking approval and reimbursement for her work-related expenses. Instead, LaPierre submitted reimbursement requests for his niece's travel expenses on numerous occasions. For example, in early 2017, LaPierre expensed $12,332.75 for his niece's eight-night stay at the Four Seasons Hotel in Dallas, Texas. The nightly rate for the room was $1,350. In 2016 and 17, LaPierre was reimbursed over $38,000 in expenses for his niece's airfare and lodging. Between 2009 and 2017, LaPierre expensed over $100,000 in membership fees for a golf club located in the Washington, D.C. area. LaPierre testified that he uses the golf course for both personal and business reasons. In its annual filings with the Attorney General for 2014 to 2018, the NRA asserted that it required substantiation prior to reimbursing these expenses. The Attorney General has not found any evidence that the golf membership fees and related business uses were substantiated prior to reimbursement. In early 2019, the current treasurer learned from LaPierre that his expense reimbursements were historically handled by the NRA ILA, regardless of whether they were related to the activities of that division. Pursuant to the bylaws, their finances are maintained separately from those of the NRA general operations. LaPierre's expenses were also processed by a lower level employee in the NRA ILA. Because that employee was out of the office on sick leave, the current treasurer took the opportunity to re-engineer the process for reviewing LaPierre's expenses to make it as robust and appropriate as possible. But this new process does not capture any personal expenses incurred by LaPierre that are billed by vendors directly to the NRA. So, when LaPierre's travel expenses are billed directly to the NRA, such as by LaPierre's travel consultant, as discussed above, they will only be subject to review by a lower level employee. From 2013 to 2018, the EVP office budget allocated several million dollars each year to LaPierre's personal and home security. LaPierre testified that he does not control the people that manage my security. I let the director of security run that and make the decisions. The director of security reports directly to LaPierre. LaPierre testified that he does not know everything the director of security is spending money on, but that the treasurer does. The director of security procured an armored vehicle for LaPierre without notifying the purchasing division or complying with the NRA purchasing policy. The director of purchasing testified that this was not the first time the director of security had made procurements in contravention of NRA policy, noting that he has a habit of, he will just go and do whatever he needs to get it done. LaPierre testified that after the Parkland, Florida shooting in February 2018, his director of security advised him to leave the Washington, D.C. area because of a number of threats that had been made against him. Shortly thereafter, according to LaPierre, the co-founder of Ackerman proposed having a real estate investment company that he owned purchase a house that LaPierre and his wife could use as a safe house from time to time. Over a three-week period in April 2018, LaPierre and his wife looked at several homes in the Dallas, Texas area with a realtor and an Ackerman executive. LaPierre and his wife identified a home in the suburb of Westlake that, at the time, was valued at approximately $6.5 million. On May 11, 2018, Phillips and an Ackerman executive executed an agreement to establish a limited liability company named WBB Investments, LLC. Under this agreement, the NRA agreed to invest $6.5 million for a 99% interest in the company. On May 21, 2018, an Ackerman executive sent an email to the Ackerman CFO copying LaPierre's wife, stating, LaPierre's wife copied here, and I spoke this morning. Following are my notes from the conversation to assist you in the offer document. The email lists 
equipment and furnishings to retain as part of offer on the Westlake home and then provides also, can we request from owner a listing of all service vendors for various aspects of the house? When we last looked, it appeared the homeowner was making a binder of all relevant information. We would like that documentation. Home improvements prior to move in. This wouldn't affect the offer, but a security gate needs to be designed and installed for the driveway. The men's master bathroom and closet need some changes. There isn't much closet space and the cabinetry needs to be changed. LaPierre's wife will have specific input here and can probably work with the eventual interior designer to get this work accomplished. We need to discuss how to acquire a social membership to the club. Is a July 1 closing possible so that an August move-in could be anticipated? Time to get some rooms furnished and the above improvements completed prior to move-in. Two vehicles will need to be purchased prior to move-in as well. The same day, WBB Investments LLC sent an invoice to the NRA for $70,000 for investments in security assets. Under NRA policy, the FSD, or Financial Services Division, cannot issue a payment to the vendor without having a valid Form W-9 on file. Upon receipt of the invoice from WBB Investments LLC on May 25th, 2018, staff in the FSD informed staff in the treasurer's office that a W-9 was needed for WBB Investments before the invoice could be processed. In response, Phillips and his successor, who had become the CFO by that time, told FSD staff in sum and substance that payment was urgent and cut the check immediately. The Director of Financial Reporting and Accounting wrote in an email, as we discussed, cut without W-9 for now, even though it's against policy per Treasurer's office. On May 30th, 2018, WBB Investments deposited the NRA's check for $70,000. Shortly thereafter, the deal was called off and the money was returned. LaPierre and Ackerman dispute the reasons why the house sale was not completed. LaPierre claims that it was because he realized that Ackerman wanted the NRA to pay for the house. LaPierre did not explain why Ackerman would have invested in the property for his use. So we're going to skip ahead now. Past a section on Treasurer Woody Phillips' conflict of interest and self-dealing, past Chief of Staff Josh Powell's conflict of interest and negligence allegations, past General Counsel's section on negligence and false annual filings, and past a section about LaPierre's senior assistant, who is also accused of diverting money for personal expenses. The lawsuit goes on to accuse the NRA of using vendors and consulting agreements to hide improper expenses and payments, including improper self-dealing. Another section describes allegations involving excessive compensation that was not disclosed by the NRA. Under both state and federal law, non-profit employees may only be paid reasonable compensation. The Internal Revenue Service creates a rebuttable presumption that compensation is reasonable if, one, the authorized body within the organization made up of independent individuals approves the compensation in advance, two, the authorized body relies on appropriate data as to comparability, and three, the authorized body adequately and timely documents the basis for the determination concurrently with making that determination. The documentation should include the terms of the transaction and the date of its approval, the members of the authorized body present during the debate and the vote on the transaction, the comparability data obtained and relied upon, the actions of any members of the authorized body having a conflict of interest, and documentation of the basis for the determination. In its official filings, the NRA made misleading representations regarding its practices for setting executive compensation. For example, in its IRS Form 990 for each year from 2015 to 2018, the NRA represented that compensation of the NRA's top management officials is established by methods including independent compensation consultants, compensation surveys and studies, and comparability data. The NRA further represented in its filings that, in addition, under the NRA bylaws, compensation of certain elected officers, including the executive vice president, must be approved by the board of directors based on recommendations by the compensation committee. All decisions are properly documented. Contrary to the NRA's representations, the NRA board set the compensation for LaPierre, Phillips, and Frazier during the period of 2015 to 2018 without relying upon or properly consulting a compensation consultant, considering reliable compensation surveys, or obtaining appropriate comparability data. The board also did not maintain adequate documentation of the process of determining officer compensation. 
On September 7th, 2017, the OCC met and recommended increases in cash compensation for each of LaPierre, Phillips, and Frazier. It recommended that LaPierre's compensation be increased from approximately $1.43 million in 2017 to approximately $1.78 million in 2018, which included an increase in his bonus from $150,000, the amount he had been awarded each year from 2015 to 2017, to $455,000 in 2018. The OCC recommended that Phillips' total compensation be increased from approximately $669,000 in 2017 to approximately $830,000 in 2018, which included a bonus of $210,000. It also recommended that Frazier's compensation be increased from 2017 levels when his reported total compensation was $375,000 to approximately $414,000 for 2018, which includes a bonus of $54,100. No benchmarks or specific performance achievements were set out in regard to the recommended bonuses. Furthermore, as detailed below, the amount reported as compensation in the NRA's IRS Form 990 for 2018 paid to LaPierre, Phillips, and Frazier was more than what was authorized by the OCC. In addition, as also discussed below, the reported amounts did not reflect the full compensation for the individual defendants. A review of NRA records between 2013 and 2018 demonstrates cursory OCC reports from the board, usually less than a full page, pro forma approval of the OCC recommendations, and little time for debate or consideration in executive sessions at board meetings. The OCC did not carry out its duties under the NRA bylaws, New York, or federal law in regard to ensuring that only reasonable compensation is paid and exposed the NRA to liability for federal excise tax based upon unreasonable and excessive compensation and distributions to disqualified persons. As a charitable nonprofit, the NRA is required to report on the IRS Form 990 compensation for both current and former officers, directors, key employees, and highest compensated employees. The IRS compensation disclosure requirements include, without limitation, base salary, bonuses, incentive compensation, contributions to retirement plans, the value of benefits such as health, disability, long-term care and life insurance, housing and automobile allowances, and taxable travel, meals, and entertainment expenses. From 2015 to 2018, the NRA reported paying LaPierre $10,191,728 in total compensation for an average of over $2.5 million a year. In its annual IRS Form 990 filings, the NRA reported the following breakdown of LaPierre's compensation for 2015 through 2018, as shown here on the screen. But as discussed, the NRA pays or reimburses LaPierre's personal travel by charter plane and personal travel for family members. LaPierre is also reimbursed for other expenses that are not submitted within a reasonable time. The value of those travel and other reimbursed expenses constitutes taxable income to LaPierre that was required to be reported. In spring 2018, LaPierre recruited dissident number one to run for NRA president. At the time, the plan was for dissident number one to complete the remainder of the outgoing president's term. He would then be renominated by the board to serve out a full term as president. At the time dissident number one was recruited by LaPierre, he had a contract at Fox News to provide multiple episodes of a program called American Heroes, under which he received significant compensation and health benefits. The NRA bylaws did not permit dissident number one to receive a salary from the NRA as NRA president, and Fox News was unwilling to retain dissident number one's contract for American Heroes if he became president of the NRA. A little basic Googling appears to reveal Ali North of the Iran-Contra scandal as dissident number one. Quote, in late 1985, under the Reagan administration, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North of the National Security Council diverted a portion of the proceeds from the Iranian weapons sales to fund the Contras, a group of anti-Sandinista rebels in their insurgency against the socialist government of Nicaragua. A jury convicted him of accepting an illegal gratuity, obstruction of a congressional inquiry, 
and destruction of documents. The convictions were overturned on appeal because his Fifth Amendment rights may have been violated through the use of previously immunized testimony. As duly elected president, dissident number one viewed it as his fiduciary duty to ensure that the finances of the NRA were being managed prudently. Almost immediately after taking charge as NRA president in September 2018, dissident number one started looking closely at the operations of the NRA. At this time, he was also alerted to certain problems by internal whistleblowers, NRA board members, and major donors. In October 2018, dissident number one convened a group of advisors to provide advice and recommendations to the president and executive vice president on matters crucial to the good governance of the association. In an agenda for an October 24th, 2018 meeting of its members, dissident number one identified a series of key questions, including where did Josh Powell come from? Who vetted Josh? Are rumors about Josh and sexual harassment true? What is the status of the whistleblower accusations? And how is the current treasurer working out as treasurer? This agenda provides insight into the types of issues that dissident number one was trying to address in the performance of his responsibilities as president. As his presidency progressed, dissident number one became concerned about the fact that the NRA was paying the Brewer firm about $2 million per month in fees that were not properly authorized or reviewed. The Brewer firm was initially retained by the NRA in March of 2018 to address issues involving NRA affinity partners. Between March of 2018 and February of 2019, the Brewer firm charged the NRA approximately $19 million in legal fees. By board resolution adopted March 8th, 2019, the audit committee determined that the original contract between the NRA and the Brewer firm did not comply with the internal controls and policies established by the NRA. When executing the original engagement letter with the Brewer firm, Frazier did not obtain written approval from the president and a vice president as required by NRA policy. When asked why he did not comply with NRA policy in entering into this contract with the Brewer firm, Frazier testified, it was an error on my part. In light of the internal control issues with the Brewer firm's engagements and the fees being charged and paid under the circumstances, Dissident number one began to demand more comprehensive reviews of the firm's retainer agreements and invoices. In March 2019, dissident number one sent a series of letters and memoranda to the NRA Board Council, Audit Committee, and General Counsel raising concerns about the Brewer firm's engagement and its billing practices. In a March 11, 2019 letter, dissident number one directed the NRA Board Council to notify the Brewer firm that none of its retainer agreements with the NRA had been reviewed or approved by the NRA's elected non-salaried officers. A few days later, dissident number one sent a similar letter to Frazier asking him to request from the Brewer firm copies of all relevant engagement letters. Despite dissident number one's demands, neither the audit committee nor others on the NRA board were permitted to conduct a review of the Brewer firm's invoices. When dissident number one began making inquiries into the Brewer firm's billings and the operations of the NRA, LaPierre impeded his participation of the NRA's affairs and took steps to ensure he would not be re-elected as president. LaPierre believed that dissident number one's inquiries into the NRA's affairs exceeded the purview of the NRA president, which LaPierre sees as a largely ceremonial position. LaPierre testified that dissident number one started to interfere in, in a lot of things that weren't under the role of the president. They, they were actually more the day-to-day -day management stuff. In a September 2019 deposition, LaPierre recalled telling dissident number one that he cannot keep interfering in all of the day-to-day -day affairs of the NRA. That's my job, and you need to stay out of it to protect yourself. But it's also my job, not yours. In late 2018, LaPierre started raising concerns about dissident number one's relationship with Ackerman, which LaPierre had been instrumental in arranging. LaPierre claimed to have been unaware of dissident number one's employment at Ackerman and ultimately used it to retaliate against dissident number one and to prevent any scrutiny of Brewer's legal fees. 
LaPierre repeatedly denied dissident number one access to Brewer's retention agreements and invoices. On at least two occasions, LaPierre sent cease and desist letters to dissident number one, demanding that he stop looking into the matter. LaPierre also repeatedly denied dissident number one's request for an independent audit of Brewer. In late March 2019, LaPierre sent a follow-up letter demanding that dissident number one, as a highly compensated full-time employee of Ackerman McQueen with an obvious conflict of interest, desist immediately from his attempts to burden or obstruct the NRA's engagement of outside counsel on matters pertaining to Ackerman. On April 24, 2019, LaPierre's senior assistant informed dissident number one that LaPierre will not support you in your term as NRA president. On April 25th, 2019, dissident number one wrote to the executive committee. He asserted that the NRA was facing a crisis that could affect its ability to operate as a nonprofit organization and that it was his fiduciary duty to respond to the crisis. He stated his intention to form a crisis management committee pursuant to NRA bylaws. One of the tasks the proposed crisis management committee would undertake would be to supervise an outside independent review of the invoices submitted by Brewer attorneys and counselors, which total more than $24 million over a short period of time. Just days later, dissident number one announced his resignation during the NRA's annual meeting in Indianapolis. In a letter read to NRA members, dissident number one stated, I hoped to be with you today as NRA president endorsed for re-election. I'm now informed that will not happen. There is clearly a crisis. It needs to be dealt with immediately and responsibly so that NRA can continue to focus on protecting the Second Amendment. Despite resigning from his position as NRA president, dissident number one did not resign from the NRA wholesale. Rather, he continued on the NRA board and remained part of the NRA's membership. The NRA is currently conducting an internal expulsion proceeding against dissident number one, which was undertaken in retaliation for his exercise of fiduciary responsibilities in violation of its whistleblower policy. In June 2020, the NRA filed an action in New York State Court seeking a declaratory judgment that the expulsion of dissident number one is proper. Litigation related to that action is ongoing. Goosebumps! <laughs> In section five, there are allegations that the audit committee had no responsibilities to conduct any internal investigations, including failing to investigate reports from whistleblowers. In his testimony to the attorney general, the audit committee chair said that he had no knowledge of New York law governing audit committees, whistleblowers, or conflicts of interest, and could not recall the last time he had seen the charter, the Articles of Incorporation or Corporation Charter. He also testified that in his view, and contrary to the charter, the audit committee had no role in oversight of internal controls and that its role was significantly more limited than the role set out for the committee in its charter. Section six details how the NRA failed to put in place any effective compliance program to ensure that officers, directors, and employees complied with state and federal law. And section seven details how the NRA made false reports on required regulatory filings to New York and the IRS. Whew. Well, that was a lot. The final part is now about the causes of action and the relief that the attorney general seeks. The New York Attorney General accuses the NRA and the individual defendants of the following causes of action. The first count is for the dissolution of the NRA under New York state law. This section details how the New York Attorney General can bring a lawsuit to dissolve a non-compliant, not-for-profit corporation which violates the law by acting beyond its capacity and by persistently disregarding the limitations in its Articles of Incorporation and by conducting business in an illegal manner and by abusing its powers contrary to the public policy of the state of New York by operating without effective oversight or control by its officers and directors. The second cause of action also calls for the dissolution of the NRA this time for the looting and wasting of corporate assets, perpetuating the corporation solely for personal benefit or otherwise acting in an illegal, oppressive, or fraudulent manner by the directors or members in control. The third cause of action alleges a breach of fiduciary duty and calls for the removal of defendant Wayne LaPierre 
Fiduciary duties are those of loyalty, care, and obedience to the organization for which you have a fiduciary duty. For example, as an attorney, I have a fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of my client. When one is a board member of a corporation, that member must act in the best interests of the corporation and must also appropriately handle any conflicts of interest that arise from time to time. This count alleges that LaPierre's personal enrichment and failure to properly report constitute a major breach of his fiduciary duties and require him to be removed as an officer and a board member. The next three causes of action are for breach of fiduciary duty against Fraser, Powell, and Phillips. The 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th causes of action all allege violations of New York State's estate, power, and trust law against the individual defendants. The 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th causes of action relate to defendants' failure to disclose conflicts of interest and properly recuse themselves from related activities. The next three causes of action relate to the NRA's violations of the whistleblower protections in New York law, as well as the management of institutional funds and false filings. The final cause of action is for unjust enrichment against the individual defendants. The New York Attorney General concludes by requesting the following judgment and relief. Dissolving the NRA and directing that its remaining assets and any future assets be applied to charitable uses consistent with the mission set forth in the NRA's Certificate of Incorporation. Declaring that the NRA has exceeded the authority conferred upon it by law, has carried on, conducted, or transacted its business in a persistently fraudulent or illegal manner, or has abused its powers contrary to the public policy of the state of New York, and determining in the court's discretion that it is in the interest of the public to dissolve the NRA. Declaring that directors or members in control of the NRA have looted or wasted the NRA's charitable assets, have perpetuated the corporation solely for their personal benefit, or otherwise acted in an illegal, oppressive, or fraudulent manner, and determining in the court's discretion that it is in the interest of the members to dissolve the NRA. Removing LaPierre for cause from his position as executive vice president of the NRA and permanently barring his re-election or appointment as an NRA officer or director. Removing Frazier for cause from his position as general counsel and secretary of the NRA and permanently barring his re-election or appointment. Permanently barring the individual defendants from serving as officers, directors, or trustees of any not-for-profit or charitable organization incorporated or authorized to conduct business or solicit charitable donations in the state of New York. Directing the individual defendants to account for their conduct. Enjoining, voiding, or rescinding the related party transactions entered into or proposed by defendants and requiring an accounting. Enjoining the NRA and Frazier from soliciting or collecting funds. Directing the individual defendants to pay the NRA restitution for all excessive, unreasonable, and excess benefits that were paid to and unjustly enriched the individual defendants. Directing the board of directors to provide an accounting for its official conduct and all other relief the court deems just and proper. And this has been filed by Attorney General Letitia James of the state of New York. Wow. So the state of New York is accusing the NRA of multiple major violations of their own charter and mission, of breach of fiduciary duties, and of self-dealing. These accusations boil down to the NRA abandoning its mission to advocate for Second Amendment rights, in favor of exploiting its membership and finances for the personal gain of individual leaders, especially Wayne LaPierre and his family. Meanwhile, it seems Oliver North is the good guy here, playing the role of a whistleblower against whom Pierre and some board members retaliated. A few years ago, I was pressured to join the NRA, but I refused, even after some heated arguments with my fellow shooters. I smelled a rat, and my gut told me to stay the heck away. Instead, I joined another rights group who provides legal insurance in the event of a firearms-related situation. What do you think of this situation? If you think this is a witch hunt, that's fine, but please provide an example of what you think should happen if it turns out that the NRA really did violate its own mission and funneled charity money to its leaders. And if you're happy to see such violations punished, do you think dissolving the NRA is really going to help? Would you be okay with some kind of court-monitored reform that includes kicking out the violators and forbidding them from serving in a nonprofit position ever again? 
I look forward to reading your thoughts, but please keep it civil. Thank you for joining me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Lawful Masses, your favorite legal education program here on YouTube, on Floatplane, and Twitch. We are community supported, meaning your monthly financial contribution on Patreon or Sponsus directly supports the creation of more content. Thank you to the following $50 plus supporters in the month of August. Nicely Done Defense, Wes Delge, Citizen of the Sovereign, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Spirit Bear, Jan de Grey, Benjamin Hightoff, Steven, Blackleaf, Cute Grills in Your Area, Longreach Jones, Definitely Not Prenda Law, Ugly Grill, Shiloh T, Rudolph Besherer Jr., Oscar the Prophet, Jay Dixon, Hot Grills in Your Area, Ammonite, Engineer, Brandon Abel, Torpedon, and Creative Corruptions. I will see you for our live Sunday show at twitch.tv slash lawful masses at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I love you all. Have a good one. Bye.